get right into it and we'll start with question number 10, which is a very common question, what rod should I buy? Now we're talking about light tackle, light tackle jigging, you hear the term, I don't like the term light tackle jigging because I don't just jig, I cast, so I call it light tackle casting because sometimes you're retrieving lures and sometimes you're throwing top water. So here's the basics. So you short bass rods for jigging, soft plastics and metal lures. By short, I'm six foot four. That's about what's wrong. <laughs> it started out at six eight, I think, but I'm a little off the end of it. That's uh, probably six six uh, now. So, so short bass rods for jigging soft plastics and metal lures. Longer, slower rods for casting diving plugs and top water. The reason for that is the longer the rod is, the more leverage you have, and so you, and the whippier a rod is, the further you can cast it. Well, we're not talking about casting long distances when we're talking about jigging, so that's why you get away with shorter and faster rods. So let's talk about rod classification. So it's basically <coughs> four things. First is length. And I just talked about this one, six four. Six eight's about as long as I will go to for jigging. Uh, seven foot, I think, is too long. Action is also called speed or taper, and all the action is, that's why I say fast, that's what I'm talking about. It's where the rod bends. So if, a rod, if you grab a rod and bend it like that, and it bends all the way down here, that's a slow rod. But if it's stiff all the way up to the tip, that's a fast rod. And they even make them an extra fast. Now this, what I'm showing you here, is a PAL rod, six foot eight inch, so I guess that's what it started as, medium, extra fast action, it says 18 to 14 pound test. So the, the pound test, don't worry about it. Don't worry about that at all. But what you need to worry about is the other, the other specs, and it's always gonna be on the side of the rod. The next is power. Power is just how strong the rod is, how big. And they usually say ultra light, light, medium, uh, uh, and Medium heavy. Medium heavy, so I couldn't think of that thing very. Right. Uh, and then heavy, and then they go on up from there, you know. Uh, and so I like medium rods, and I'll use medium rods uh, for rock fish no matter what. I've landed, you know, 53 inch fish on this rod, this actual rod right here. And it's not that hard to get them in. You don't wear them out, and you usually have them in the boat within, you know, five, seven minutes or so. Uh, and it's just all about the technique. <laughs> now, if you're just starting out and you want to use medium heavy, Go ahead and use a medium heavy, but remember you're sacrificing sensitivity. The, the bigger, the heavier the rod, the less sensitivity you have. I'll talk about sensitivity. So, an answer to the question. Use six foot six to six foot eight medium power, fast or extra fast. Use six foot eight to seven foot five medium power, fast or medium speed. If you're throwing top water, rattle traps, any kind of lures like that. You can also get away with a six foot eight or six foot six. So you don't have to, don't sweat it. It's just it's the perfect world. I like a little uh, longer rod. Uh, go up to medium heavy for bulls or red, uh, for bull reds or cobia, and go down to lighter ultra light for panfish. Simple as necessary, and you'd have to have it in order to tune in and be sensitive. My father used to say, think down the line. And by that he meant, think about what's going on with that lure as it's under the water. And when you get really tuned in, you can tell the difference between a stump and a rock between a mud bottom and a sand bottom, and you can certainly feel when a fish bites. Me and John Page Williams, one time we were out in my shop and we were about two thirds of the way through a, uh, a nice bottle of scotch. <laughs> and we got in a conversation about whether or not a fish, whether or not you can feel a fish bite before he actually touches the lure. And we decided that we think you probably can. And here's why. If you've ever caught a big rockfish and felt a big rockfish strike, you know that there is a whoosh as that fish sucks the water, it sucks that uh, lure in, it has to move the water, right? So you feel the whoosh before you feel the, the lip touch the, uh, touch the uh, lure. Because you always know it's a big fish when you feel that whoosh. And, it, and I know there's some of you in, the, in here that know what I'm talking about. So when you're really tuned in, you, you feel everything. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so we are very fortunate here in Maryland that we have several uh, local lure manufacturers that make some really darn good lures. Uh, for example, BKD, Bill is out there today with his lures. They're fantastic. You notice that's what I'm fishing on the power plant right now with uh, Bustin' Baits. 
those guys, you know, right here, not too far from here, where they make them, they're great lures. Uh, and there's differences, and there's differences uh, that, that you can make work for you between those. First of all, floating versus sinking. BKDs float, bust and bait sink. Did you know that? Drop them in the water and look at them. Make that work for you. If I'm fishing deep, I'm probably going to want to use a bust and bait. If I'm fishing shallow, I might want to use a BKD. If I'm looking uh, for, a, if I'm fishing on a, weighted, a weightless hook and I just want it to come across the water like a top water plug, I want a BKD. I don't want that lure sinking. I want it to be on the surface. Uh, so you can make both of those lures work for you uh, depending on that. Speaking of floating, Z-Mans. You know, Z-Man came along about 10 years ago, and they're fantastic. And uh, this happened to have some in my pocket. There's a lot of advantages for a Z-Man. The first is that they float, and they float high. Uh, and so you're always looking for a balance. So if I put a, a three-quarter ounce jig head on that lure right there, it's going to float. It's going to sink like that at an angle, at a, almost a 45-degree angle. If I put it on a sinking lure, like a, like a, a zoom bait or a busting bait, it's gonna go down like that. So if I'm fishing on the bottom, that's okay. But if I'm fishing suspended fish, I want that thing at an angle. I want it to look like a normal minnow would look swimming in the water, right? Different situations, different buoyancy. Uh, and the other reason I like these lures is just cause you can do that. <laughs> you can't break it. <laughs> I <laughs> finally broke it, uh, but, but then it's still, you still use it, so you just broke right there on the end. <laughs> so when bluefish are around, they'll eventually bite through it, but that's a, that's a great lure to use because another kind of lure, they're going to they're gonna eat it right up, and they bite the tails off of me. AdSense and color contrast, there's a whole section on that, especially in my second book, The Right Stuff, uh, and because... I like to use, I, use, I, I sometimes do a talk about strike triggers, and strike triggers are just what makes, what gets a reaction strike out of a fish. Sometimes it's color, or color contrast, and sometimes it's scents and smells. So I had, I had whatever I can add. I've talked to fly fishermen sometimes, and they say it's cheating. They had scents and smells, well, I'm a cheater. Sharp snap. So I'll pop, pop, and you can hear it like that. So I'm using my finger as a fulcrum, I've got my, my, I like these open, uh, open reels so I can feel the blank right there. So I've got two points of contact on the blank, blank. That gives me more sensitivity. But you see when I jerk up and stop, there's slack in the line. Well, I can't really demonstrate because I don't have any weight on there now, but that's usually what happens is people try to jerk too hard and they get all that slack in there and the fish almost always hits on the way down as the lure is falling. So if you don't have that line tight, you're not gonna feel the strike and you're gonna miss the fish or you're not gonna get a good hook set on the fish. So the best thing to do is to learn how to keep that line tight. And it might be just raise it and lower it to start out with when you're first learning it. But then as you get better, you can do the snap jig and you can do a whole lot more snap out there. It's gonna get it around. And I study pictures on social media just like everybody else does. And if there's background in that picture, I, I, I actually do have a photographic memory for places and I always have had it. It's not as good now as it used to be when I was a kid. Um, but I, Jamie will send me pictures and say, where is this? And I usually get it uh, just like that, just from wherever the background is, just because I remember you know, what those backgrounds look like when I'm out there. I learned that by triangulating before GPS's came along. You find three points and triangulate yeah. to find out where you park your boat, right? And you can put yourself over a, uh, over a, uh, um, over a lard bucket uh, by triangulating if you want to. Uh, but how do I know where to go? My time is up and I was gonna spend more time on that, on this, but here's some tips. Light tackle has a reputation of just being bird chasers, right? I rarely chase birds. Sometimes in the fall, big birds, I'll chase birds. But in the summertime, I'm never looking at birds. I'm looking for structure, points, or ledges that dissect the normal flow of current at a 90 degree angle. That's the most important thing where if you're fishing in a creek, or if you're fishing in a river, or if you're fishing in the Chesapeake Bay, or you're fishing in the ocean. You wanna look for those ledges that come out and dissect the normal flow of current so that that current has to either flow up or around 
or under whatever that structure is. For example, the Bay Bridge, or I just showed you a picture of the Kent Narrow sewer, uh, sewer Pipe, because those are places that dissect the normal north-south flow of current. They go east-west. And those are always good fishing spots because one, it gives fish a place to hide, and the second thing is it gives them an ambush point uh, where they can get out of the current and wait and rest and then attack the fish. Stripers <coughs> always face upstream. So if I'm casting, I'm always casting upstream. I want my lure coming downstream. Just the direction the bait is most likely to come because I know they're looking. I don't want that lure hitting them in the tail. I want it hitting them in the nose. Uh, so always cast upstream when you can. Look for rips. That'll tell you. That'll tell you. A rip is just where the waves change. Uh, and that where if I'm fishing top water spot or the bay bridge, I'm still looking for where those rips are. Up current corner of the deepest spot. A good example of that is the Bay Bridge rock piles. And if I go out there right now and there's an incoming current coming across the Bay Bridge rock piles, there's going to be a nice rip coming off the, if it's outgoing, it's going to be the northwest corner. So that's a good rule for anywhere you go. Look for the deep section corner, the deepest section and the corner, and cast up into it. And that, that's usually where the fish are. At the Bay Bridge Rock Pile, it's going to be a spot no bigger than a pickup truck bed where they're all holding. And you learn it pretty quickly uh, once you look at your fish finder and you can see them down there. But that's what I'm looking for is the up current channel side corner. And that's where I'm usually casting to. Oyster bars are great. You can find oysters out there, fish them. Because oysters bring in the bait. First of all, there's little crabs down there, there's worms, there's things that little fish eat, big fish eat little fish, and they all show up. And finally, I said network makes the dream work. What uh, we're doing here, everybody getting together, and talking and meeting people and stuff, this is the best thing you can do. I can't be out there fishing uh, every day, but I can have a buddy who's out there fishing every day, or I can know people at are, and so they can tell me. So how do, you, how do you build a network? You just meet people on the water for one thing, go to club meetings, like the one here in Annapolis. Fantastic fishing club, they put on stuff like this. Go to the meeting. You're gonna find people there who wanna fish just like you do. Uh, and who have probably already been doing it or they may be learning it. And you know, somebody that you can learn at the same time with. That's the way you build your network. And, uh, and there's nothing more valuable. And I take some heat online about that. When I tell people to network, hey, we gotta do it. You know, we, gotta, we gotta do it.